Uncommon Sense in Current Times. Today, I'm going to be talking with Michael Van Hus, who um, is, is authoring a book on secret societies. It's coming out, I believe, uh, next week or week after we record this. So probably by the time this gets released, you will uh, be able to get the book. Um, and I'm excited to talk to Micah because honestly, this is something I don't know much about. Um, and frankly, um, when I look at it, when I when I think about it and talk about it, it's one of those topics that I'm kind of like, Ugh, do I go this way? Do I not go this way? Like, where is it? So I'm real excited to kind of engage in this conversation to learn more about it and, and kind of see where we can go from here. So Micah comes from my home state, uh, just a different side of the state. I'm in the middle of Tennessee. He's East Tennessee, um, served in the House of Representatives, uh, was in the was Marine Sniper, if I if I read correctly. Is that right, Mike? And yes. um, so I'm excited. I'm excited to have you on. So thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate you being here. P Peter, I appreciate you having me. So so uh, just a little bit of your background. You 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 said your father was a Marine um, and you traveled all over the United States and all over the yes, world. Yes, sir. OK. Yes, sir. How did you get into this idea of secret societies? Like where did this where did this come from? Um, so Secret Societies uh, is uh, now I work for Southwest Radio Ministries uh, and I, I write books for them. Uh, basically, at Marginal Mysteries is what I produce. And we uh, study the mysteries of the universe, the mysteries of the world, the mysteries of scripture, everything from a biblical perspective. Um, and I, I uh, teach that the Bible is should be the foundation for everyone's life. Um, and so we do we look at the universe through a biblical lens. And um, so I've been working for Southwest Radio Ministries for a year and a half now. This is my third book. And uh, my first book was uh, Ancient Cities and the Gods Who Built Them. My last book was uh, The Earth As It Was, about the flood of Noah and dinosaurs and such. And this book is Secret Societies. So um, as far as getting into secret societies, um, it's been it's interested me my whole life, uh, the mystery. And, um, you know, now that now that I'm writing books for Southwest, it's just something uh, that I wanted to talk about. And so I've had a ton of fun writing the book. As you mentioned, it comes out uh, next week. Um, you can pre-order it on the website marginalmysteries.com today. Uh, but it'll print next week and uh, we'll have it ready. So um, it's been a ton of fun of, of writing and I look forward to talking about it with you. Cool. Now, when we talk about secret societies, I think it's I think we need to really kind of define that term because I can look at secret societies and say like skull and bones, you know, uh, more of a political secret societies um, that are out there. You know, I'm, I'm certain there are divisions of NSA, CIA and, and places that. And, and acronyms that we don't even know about that exist mm -hmm. in that level. Um, and, and, but when you're talking about secret societies from a biblical perspective, like, I, is it something different than that? Or how, how would you define, I guess, secret societies? Um, so I'll, I'll give the quick over, well, as quick as I can, the overview uh, backed up in scripture of what's going on. Um, so uh, the secret societies originate uh, before the flood of Noah. We're talking about the watchers coming down in Genesis chapter six and teaching forbidden knowledge to mankind. Uh, in Genesis chapter four, we read about Lamech and his two sons. Uh, this is kind of the first time in scripture where uh, men are doing uh, interesting things with technology. Uh, Lamech's sons are uh, artificer of iron, uh, mixing of the metals, uh, animal husbandmen dealing with animals uh, and different things. Um, and the Bible just talks about that. Outside of scripture, we have over a dozen ancient writings that say that the sons of Lamech knew that God was going to destroy the earth. They didn't know if it was going to be with fire or water. So they carved the forbidden knowledge of the angel, angels, the watchers taught to mankind. They carved that knowledge on two different pillars, one to survive water, one to survive fire. Uh, so the flood comes. And Hermes, what we know now as the Hermes the Greek god, finds one of the pillars uh, in the Arabic legends. It's called the Emerald Tablet. Um, but over a dozen legends talk about this, including Josephus. But Hermes the Greek god finds one of the pillars after the flood, and he shares that knowledge with Nimrod. And Nimrod is the first rebel against God after the flood, uh, the great rebel. Um, and that enables, that knowledge enables Nimrod to use uh, his knowledge to build mighty Babylon. In fact, the Freemasons uh, in their oldest text, uh, 1390 AD uh, texts say that Nimrod was the first excellent grandmaster of the Freemasons. And so Nimrod employs uh, Masons uh, to build his cities, uh, maybe the Tower of Babel. The Bible doesn't say Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, but other historians do. So likely he did. Um, so anyway, uh, real quick, I'll try to sum this up so we can get into more, but kind of the overview. The Hermetic religions, they're called Hermetic religions because Hermes found the knowledge of the Watchers. And this knowledge 
uh, these hermetic religions and philosophies. We're talking about Buddhism, Hinduism, the New Age movement, theosophy that Helena Blavatsky uh, taught. Um, we're talking all of these ideas are that of human enlightenment, that humans will one day become gods themselves. That is what the hermetic religions are. And I think it's called that because Hermes is one that found the knowledge of watchers. What did the serpent tell Eve in the Garden of Eden? The serpent told her, if you eat the fruit, you will become like God. So that is the lie of the evil princes of the powers of the air. Um, and through these secret societies, through, um, well, back up a little bit, Nimrod um, not only found the city of Babylon uh, and the, the nation of Babylon, but also he ushered in the mystery religion of Babylon. And it's important to know, we talk about the Egyptian gods, Osiris was the first mummy in Egyptian mythology. And uh, all of these ancient gods talk about the enlightenment, mankind becoming gods. Um, it's important to note that I believe that Osiris was Nimrod. I believe uh, that the Roman god Cupid was Nimrod. I believe that a lot of the ancient gods, Marduk, was actually Nimrod. Because after the Tower of Babel, God comes down to the earth and he confounds man's languages. And Nimrod is the man god who worked with at the time. So what happens when God instantaneously divides the world into seven languages? All of a sudden, you have 70 ancient names for Nimrod. Uh, so I think that most of these gods are Nimrod. All right, let's bring it to the present, and uh, we can go on to uh, a little bit deeper on whatever you want to talk about. So throughout these the millennia, these secret societies that are controlled by the princes of the powers of the air uh, are trying to usher in an age of human enlightenment, where humankind uh, becomes God themselves. And that's what Satan is telling us. We will become gods. Um, and through this knowledge of the Watchers, um, they will usher in, uh, they're looking for a battle with the God of uh, creation. They're trying to usher in a battle with God. Well, guess what? They're going to get their battle. It's called the Battle of Armageddon, but they're not going to win. So the secret societies, uh, the princes of powers there behind them, they ultimately be successful uh, in ushering in the battle, but they're going to lose. Uh, so that's the, the overview. And there are all kinds of details in the middle. So whatever you want to talk about. No, no that's cool. You know, I... You know, it's interesting because I don't have you ever read Jonathan Kahn's book, Return of the Gods? Um, I I haven't read it. OK, um, it's, a, it's an outstanding book. And, you know, and part of it, you know, when he when he's looking at, you know, the, the gods throughout the, you know, the, the times, whether it's Baal and, and Ashra and um, um, uh, Molech. But what he does is he can literally he traces them, how they just basically change the names throughout throughout history you know, and mm -hmm. to, to different, to different areas of it. And so like the, the Canaanite goddess of sex literally becomes Venus, which, you know, you know, uh, uh, Athena, Venus, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And even comes into today, you know, even, you know, in different areas and he does an outstanding job in, in doing it. So what you're saying, cause when I f first heard it, you know, my, 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 my skeptical side of me says, you're just talking about Greek mythology. I read Edith Hamilton. The, all that is, is there. But then when you start kind of talking about how it, it moves from forward place to place from a spiritual component to it, it there is there it, it does make a lot of sense. And you're right, it starts with Genesis. But even in you know First Timothy, I think it's first it might be second Timothy, but in Timothy, when when he's talking about the end of times, we become more lovers of self, lovers, you know, mm -hmm. when we start becoming lovers of self, we are literally removing God out of that picture. And it does mm -hmm. seem like we're moving in that direction on it mm -hmm. um but but what you're saying is there's actually groups that also help support this um throughout the years um you mentioned the watchers. Yes, tell me about the watchers absolutely and real quick um uh, isis you mentioned the goddess uh, that is uh, roots back in my book and in my uh, understanding to the wife of nimrod simiramis um and she in egyptian mythology uh, brings osiris back to life um through reincarnation um and uh it becomes uh, Osiris um, possesses his son. So basically her, his son is also himself for us. Uh, and that's the first unholy trinity. All right. So uh, back to your question was the watchers. Okay. The watchers, so, yeah, yeah. so the watchers. Um, so I talk, a, I have a whole chapter on the watchers in my previous book, the earth as it was. And my next book right here is angels eternal. This won't be out for another year, March of 2025. Um, it is about the, the watchers, the angels, the fallen angels, the spiritual realm, a uh, ton of fun writing and studying. Um, so the watchers uh, are found in Daniel chapter 10 is the only place in the King James where the Bible mentions the word watchers, uh, talking about them coming from heaven, uh, down from heaven to the earth. But in Genesis chapter six, these are the Benei Elohim in the Hebrew and in the King James it's translated sons of God. 
Uh, so in Genesis chapter six, verses one through four, the B'nai Elohim, they come from heaven, they take human wives, and they have giant offspring, the mixture of angels and the mixture of humans. Uh, you have giants in the earth, and that's Genesis chapter six, verse one. And verse four, uh, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they had children of them. Um, some folks is, will say, I'm, "I'm sorry, is this the Nephilim that that some with the Bible references of the Nephilim? Is that what, what the, Nef, the Nephilim are the giants, and they are the sons and daughters of the Watchers? Okay, so fifty percent angel, fifty percent man. Of course, the angels take on human flesh. The Watchers become human. So when I say fifty percent angel, their fathers were angels. Um, so uh, the Bnei Elohim. A lot of folks will say, uh, some folks will say that this is not angels. This is talking about mankind, the godly line of Seth." Well, Job chapter 2 uh, refutes that. Job chapter 2, the B'nai Elohim are meeting in heaven with God and Satan walked among them. This is the same imagery we get in Greek mythology of Zeus on Mount Olympus meeting with the lesser gods and Hades is walking among them. Um, so it, uh, these B'nai Elohim are in heaven in Job chapter 2. So these are angels. Um, the So uh, we go outside the Bible. I believe that the Bible, the 66 books we have are the inspired word of God. Um, and I believe that should be everybody's foundation. Uh, there are plenty of ancient writings, and I'm getting get into the Book of Enoch a little bit. I don't think that the Book of Enoch is inspired, so don't don't think that. But I have done a lot of studying on it, and I think what it's talking about fills in the puzzle pieces. So uh, the Book of Enoch says more about what's going on in Genesis chapter 6. In the days of Jared, the fifth generation from Adam, the watchers, 200 of them led by Shinyaza and Azazel, they descended, they, they took human women. Uh, they knew that God was going to curse them uh, to a mortal death. Uh, they decided to rebel, rebel against them anyway. And that's why 200 of them got together because Shinyaza didn't want to do it alone. Uh, in there, they uh, sire the giants and they teach all kinds of forbidden knowledge to mankind. And when we get into forbidden knowledge, I'm talking about the knowledge that Hermes found that he shared with Nimrod, um, the secret knowledge um, of enlightenment that will be revealed, some of it in the revelation scenario at the resurrection of the image of the beast. So continue. Um, the, the watchers teach all kinds of things to mankind, including abortion, makeup, weapons, armor. Um, alchemy, astronomy, astrology, all kinds of just forbidden knowledge to mankind. There is one location in scripture that we find angels teaching knowledge to mankind, and that's Revelation chapter 21, verse 17. Uh, uh, John is having a vision of a man measuring heaven with a cubit. It says that is the measurement of a man that is of the angel. So Revelation 21, 17 tells us that the angels taught the cubit to mankind. That's the only place in scripture I can find the backup for teaching the knowledge of the watchers. Um, but there are plenty of uh, locations in scripture that backs up what the book of Enoch is saying about the watchers. And I'll get into that in one second. Uh, after the watchers teach the knowledge of mankind, their children, the giants, the Nephilim, uh, they, when mankind could no longer satiate the giants, the giants began to eat mankind and drink their blood, basically destroying Elohim's creation. In Genesis chapter six, I think verse seven, very powerful statement. One of the most powerful statements in entirety of scripture is it repented God that he had made creation, that he had made man and made the animals. That is a powerful statement. Um, and so I believe that the uh, Nephilim and the Watchers were genetically modifying Elohim's creation, mixing animal DNA, mixing animal and human DNA. Uh, and that's what Genesis chapter 6 verse 7 is referencing. Um, what do you see when you look at the ancient Egyptian gods? They're half human, half animal. What do you see with the ancient Greek and Roman gods? They're super powerful humans. Um, so as we get into um, the, the, the corruption of the world, um, in the book of Enoch, God sends four archangels, Uriel, uh, to warn Noah. He sends Gabriel to cause the giants to go to war against each other. He sends Raphael and Michael to bind Azazel and Shemyaza and cast them into the prison, into the abyss in chains. Uh, keep that in mind. This is the book of Enoch, which I don't take as inspired, but God tells them to cast the watchers into the prison, at least the leaders of watchers. Well, in Isaiah, it says the Messiah, it prophesies that the Messiah will visit the spirits in prison. Well, let's read about that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18, 19, and 20. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, 19, and 20. Jesus dies on the cross in verse 18. It says he's in the spirit form on the earth and not in his flesh. Uh, and then verse 19, he goes down into the pit and he proclaims his victory. And then in verse 20, he proclaimed his victory to the spirits that made trouble in the days of Noah. That's backed up. Uh, the story in Enoch is backed up in First Peter. Also, Second Peter says kind of the same thing. Jude chapter one verse six quotes the book of Enoch, and it says, "The angels which kept not their first estate, he has cast in chains in everlasting darkness." Um, and so, yeah. So, while I don't take the book of Enoch as inspired, I do believe that it's backed up plenty of places in Scripture, and it's fascinating to study.
So how are you making the determination of a mythology and, 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 and in reality, because many of the texts that are written from ancient times are written from an idea of, 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 of mythology in a ways that the, the, the ancient civilizations were able to explain the world. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, there are multiple, there are multiple avenues or, or multiple stories of the flood. You know, the Babylonians have a story of a flood and have the story. It's more like a box of the, the family that survives it more mm -hmm. than, a, than an ark. You know, there, there are there, there are different uh, characterizations. I think the flood is probably the best one because I think every civilization has some some level of story mm -hmm. with it. So how are you making the determination of this I feel is accurate, this here is mythology, and this here is the I'm not sure and so I'm not really quite sure what to deal with it. Like, how, how do you, wh what, what standard do you use to do that? The direct answer to your question is the Bible. Uh, I don't use uh, these mythologies to look through them and say, oh, the Bible's correct about this. No, I use the Bible to look at these mythologies and say that that's what those guys are trying to get at. Uh, so as you said, there are tons of similarities between uh, the mythologies and the, and the Bible. Um, the flood account creation is probably the second biggest, yeah. um, all kinds of, of of uh, similarities. And, and one of my points in all of my studies, in fact, my uh, fifth book, which will come out in 2026, is Mythologies Decoded, where I'm uh, uh, laying out a timeline of scripture. And anything from mythology that uh, points to scripture uh, is going to be what that book is about. So anyway, that's two years off. But um, so yes, th there's a whole lot more truth to mythology. So for instance, uh, in uh, Hercules, Hercules is tasked with killing the Lanarian Hydra. The Hydra is a, a multiple headed dragon. Well, guess what? In Job, Leviathan, the creature of the deep, has multiple heads. Um, I don't know the verse off the top of my head, but um, it talks about Leviathan having multiple heads. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that there's a whole lot more truth to mythology than people like to give credit to. Uh, for instance, let's get into another topic, which will be, again, covered in Angels Eternal. We're talking about the princes of the nations. Um, my theory um, is that uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 7, 8, and 9, right after the Tower of Babel, um, God divides the world into 70 nations, which I think is kind of obvious um, with dividing the languages. What is not so obvious is that in verse uh, Deuteronomy 32, 8, um, he gives the nations according to the number of the children of Israel in the King James. That's 70, the number of the children of Israel. Um, and then in the Greek Septuagint, he gives the nations to the Angelos Theos, which are the angels of God. And then in the Dead Sea Scrolls, he gives the nations to the Bene Elohim again the angels. So my theory, and I believe this is what's going on, right after the Tower of Babel, God divides the world. He says, mankind has screwed it up again, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to these angels. Um, and so he gives 70 angels over 70 nations to rule them. Again, let's back this up with scripture. Daniel chapter 10, uh, Daniel prays, and likely Gabriel, the archangel, takes 21 days to reach him because he was fighting against the evil spiritual prince of Persia. And two or three verses later, it says, I got to go because the prince of Greece is coming too. So in Daniel 10, we're reading about these princes of the nations. They're obviously spirit. So what's going on here? Daniel chapter 12, Michael the archangel is mentioned as the prince of Israel. Um, so I do believe that's what happened. Um, Psalm chapter 82 backs this up. Psalm chapter 82 is only eight verses. Uh, fascinating read. Probably the most mysterious chapter in the Bible, even over Revelation. Psalm chapter 82 um, God is meeting in heaven with the council of the gods, um, and he is judging those gods based on their treatment of their human subjects. And he says to them, if you don't tr start treating your human subjects better, I'm going to cast you to the earth like one of the princes. I mean, this is King James. I mean, this is the Bible, Psalm 82. It's fascinating. And so I think that's talking about the 70 princes that were set up. Uh, the question I get asked the most is, how did the giants come back after the flood? Well, if God put 70 angels over 70 nations and they're physical for 100 years or two, uh, they're going to take human women as wives, and you're going to have giants again. Um, I always wondered as a kid, why was why was Joshua told to kill women and children? Joshua is told to conquer. Uh, sometimes he's told just to conquer them, but sometimes he's told to kill the women and children too. Well, every now as an adult that I know this stuff, every instance where God tells Joshua to utterly wipe out the races, there are a race of giants, the Anakim, the Rephaim, the uh, um, Zimims. Um, we talked about the book of Enoch said that the giants started to eat mankind and drink their blood when they could no longer satiate them. We find that in the Bible. When the spies are sent throughout the land, they come back with an evil report of the land. They say it is filled uh, the land, the inhabitants of the land eat, excuse me, the, the giants in the land eat the inhabitants thereof. 
that's exactly what the book of Enoch had said. So um, there was one more point on the angels. Uh, I'll get to it. I'll remember it in a second. But yeah, so that, those are my thoughts and it's fascinating. I'll remember that. The Demas' family has been in the restaurant business for many generations. We have been serving people in the Middle Tennessee market for 34 years. Try our spaghetti kits, our pot roast, which we slow cook for four hours, or our world-famous baked chicken and rice soup, which many locals have dubbed Greek penicillin for when you feel under the weather. We make our food fresh, and upon placing our order with us, we freeze the order and send it to your house. Demas's is more than a business. Five generations of restaurant operators have taught us many things about food, but more importantly, we have recognized that we don't sell food. We sell the experience of bringing people and families together, which our country desperately needs. So go to DemasFamilyKitchen.com and share in this journey today. And for right now, use the code UNCOMMON to get 10% off of your order. That's DemasFamilyKitchen.com. So, so when, I, when I'm looking at this and I just pulled up, I, I just pulled up Psalm 82 and, um, and, and it just pulled up the King James Version, which is as God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judges among the gods. You know, it, it is interesting, though, you know, where you, you do see that you see reference throughout the Bible of him referencing other gods um with it and obviously it's the lowercase g is whenever i see it it's mm -hmm. always put in that in that yeah. area um you know i think it's i think it's easy for us particularly in western civilization to dismiss the the idea that uh, of, of the spiritual realm of it and and then digging deeper into it and and kind of kind of going from there but is there also a danger so like people listening to this you know a, a danger of them um kind of kind of again moving more into to to a fictionalized version of a lot of this stuff instead of like really studying it and then again mm -hmm. so 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 i know you use the bible as your base but if you're talking to somebody else if if you're talking to just just an average person on the street that's kind of interested in this what kind of caution would you give them? Because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm certain you've gone down a path, and then you're like, oh man, this is wrong. Like I, I just spent, I just mm -hmm. spent 30 days oh, yeah. going down and hitting a brick wall. Oh yeah. Like, like what, 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 what have you learned throughout this time to be able to pass it on to other people so they can make that mm -hmm. distinction and that delineation of it? Because it's, I, I like I said, I just kind of pulled up Psalm 82, and it's fascinating. I, I literally yeah. read it probably a few months ago, and. And I didn't catch it, what you were saying in it, even though I just read it not that long ago. So it's it's kind of fascinating to me to see it in a different light. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get it. There's there's kind of four questions here, and I've written them all down. So I'm cool. gonna try to get yeah, all I'm sorry. Them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just... No, 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 no problem. I'm just uh, I might take a second to think. So uh, the first point I want to make is not directly to your first question. Psalm 82, since we're on it, um, and the mythologies, the mythologies that point to scripture, uh, the story of Atlantis that Plato wrote um, 400 BC. Um, the first thing that the story of Atlantis says is there was a time when the gods divided the world among themselves and uh, Poseidon is given the kingdom of Atlantis and he takes a human wife and he has 10 sons. Um, Atlas is the first one. Um, but in the, in the city of Atlantis, they put the gods, the, the angelic gods, half human, half God. They put a pillar of laws in the middle of Atlantis and every few years, the gods gather that pillar to judge each other on their treatment of mankind. That's almost exactly, that is what's going on in Psalm 82. So we got these things from mythology. In fact, in uh, Greek mythology, the Titanomachy, the war between the Olympians and the uh, Titans. Um, after the Olympians defeat the Titans, they divide the world among themselves. So that was my first point of just the, the mythology that points to scripture. Um, so is it dangerous to study? Very important question. Um, let, let's start with saying like demonology. That's not something that I want to get into. I know a pastor who didn't want to get into it, but he was trying to help a girl who was demon possessed. So he kind of had to get into it. Demonology is not something I want to get into. If God ever tells me to do that, I will, but I don't want to. And so I understand that there are a lot of Christians who don't want to talk about the giants and angels sleeping with women and that kind of stuff. And that's fine. I don't say that anybody has to do, study this stuff. Um, but I do believe that this is what God has asked me to do to study this stuff. He put a passion in my heart for it. And um, so I enjoy it. Is it dangerous? Um you know, I used to think, you know, I used to say, you know, I wouldn't approach a, a brand new Christian with something like this, um, but God did include it in his word. And because God included it in his word, I think it's worthy of study. But since I've been doing this, I speak at conferences and I talk to all kinds of people. Um, I've had people who actually have come to me and said they came to Christ because of this. It made so much sense. Um, so I've seen that since. So 
Um, yeah, what I recommend everybody do, um, first of all, don't forget that Christ is the central point of history and the central point of the Bible. So it's more important. Christ and knowing who Christ is and, and getting a personal relationship with him and asking him to forgive you of your sins, that is the most important. So this stuff is not anywhere as important as Christ. Um, that's number one. Um, but Jesus Christ, uh, but it's not the right word. Jesus Christ said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. He also says that his return will be as a thief in the night. So I think we need to know what it was like in the days of Noah as, an, as someone who's already saved so that we can know what's coming at the end. Um, and it could be these things. Um, uh, you mentioned, have I hit a brick wall in reverse? Yes. Um, the one thing that I reversed, I even wrote about it in the earth as it was as a theory. I didn't say this is what happened, but the uh, Nibiru, planet Nibiru, have you ever heard of planet Nibiru or studied planet X? It's the Sumerian creation mythology. Uh, they say that there's a giant red planet in our solar system uh, every 3,000. It's instead of a circular orbit like the rest of the planets, it's got an oval orbit. So it goes really far out and every 3,600 years comes back. The Sumerian story uh, talks about how that creation story, the Anunnaki coming down as astronauts to create humankind. Um, I, I, I pontificated about it because it's synonymous kind of with uh, the Genesis creation story, some of the aspects of it. But then I realized after a year that Zechariah Sitchin was, that stuff is not found in, he, he's twisted uh, Sumerian mythology. So yeah, I did hit a brick wall on that topic and I came back and I was like, well, this is not. So yeah, that, that, to answer that question there is, um, yeah, so a lot of fun. So so one of the things that I read about, I'm not sure if this is in your book or not, um, in the, the current book is about the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, when I when I think of the Illuminati, I think of that 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 movie with Tom Hanks a while back, uh, Dan National Brown, Treasure well, and Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci Code, that's it. That's the one I was thinking of, and and you know, and um, and I, I was not a Christian when I watched that. I'm I'm a I've been a Christian for about eleven years now, and and um, you know, but but you know, and again, even then it was, it was just kind of there. I recognized there, there was a foundation at some point in time of that. And then, then we moved to, and I recognize again, that there's also a fictionalized account of, of that as well. Um, is that discussed in your book? And if so, like, how do you, how do you, what are you addressing with that? So the Illuminati um, officially was very short lived, 20 years or so. Um, they started in 1776, the same year as our country, uh, but founded by Adam Weishaupt. Um, they were founded to foment revolution throughout the world. Uh, they wanted to usher in enlightenment, human enlightenment, uh, and they wanted to uh, get rid of the, 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 the existing structure. Um, and so Freemasonry was infiltrated by the Illuminati. Weishaupt said to go into Freemason lodges, and become Freemasons and recruit for the Illuminati uh, out of the Freemason lodges. Uh, and so what we see at the founding of the United States of America is a schism in Freemasonry. You have two kinds of Freemasonry. Uh, one Freemasonry believes in the good God of the Bible, uh, the holy God, and the other type of Freemasonry believes in human enlightenment corrupted by the Illuminati. Uh, so that is represented in George Washington uh, wanting uh, the good God of the Bible to be the God uh, of, of you know, who, who mankind should worship. And then Benjamin Franklin, on the other hand, who was a member of the Hellfire Club, uh, who wanted uh, America to be uh, founded on enlightenment. It was uh, Francis Bacon that wrote A New Atlantis. He and others, including Benjamin Franklin, desperately wanted the United States to be Atlantis reborn, a place to bring back the old gods, um, kind of the theme of, of, uh, of the secret societies and what we're talking about with the Hermetic religions. Um, and this is exemplified um, after George Washington died. Um, George Washington was obviously a Freemason. He said that he had not stepped foot in a Freemason lodge for the last 30 years of his life in one of his letters. Um, we have that letter in the book. You can find it in the uh, li uh, Library of Congress archives. Um, and so you, you see the struggle between the two sects of Freemasonry, one influenced by the Illuminati and the Declaration of Independence. We have multiple names for God, nature's God, uh, God Almighty. We have different names. But when George Washington died, uh, Benjamin Franklin, the Illuminati side of Freemasonry, stuck it to him. When you go into the Capitol building at the United States and you look up under the rotunda uh, of the dome of the Capitol, you'll see a painting titled The Apotheosis of Washington. The word apotheosis means ascending into godhood. And the painting is of George Washington sitting among the Roman gods. George Washington didn't get up there and paint it himself, uh, but it was the Illuminati style of Freemasonry that's teaching that we will one day as humans become gods. 
a fascinating side point on the apotheosis of Washington, there are 72 stars around uh, the apotheosis. So when we talk about 70 gods ruling the nations, um, it's unsure if it's 70 or 72, if you count God choosing Israel. Because Deuteronomy 32, 7, 8, 9, verse 8 is where I say the 70 gods were put in power. But Deuteronomy 32, 9 is where in Scripture we get that God chooses Israel. That's the point in Scripture where God chooses Israel as his nation. So you see the 72 stars around the apotheosis of Washington, in my opinion, representing the 70 fallen angels that were put over the nations. Whether they were fallen before or fallen after, I'm not sure, but it's fascinating because Psalm 82 talks about it. Um, you also see 72 uh, bricks in the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill, um, 13 uh, lines of it. Uh, the number 70, 70 to 72 keeps popping up, and um, I think it's a representation. Uh, we'll get into the symbolism. The secret societies, um, the Snake Brotherhood, no, 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 the uh, the Egyptian secret society, I forgot the name of it off the top of my head. Um, they, they passed the knowledge of the Watchers through symbolism and allegory. They never wrote it down, um, and then... Only, and this gets into a very important point. When I talk about secret societies, are they evil, etc.? cetera? Uh, there's a difference between the public face of the secret society and what's really going on behind the scenes. In fact, the low level initiates, the low level members, employees of the Catholic church, um, they're not necessarily responsible. They don't necessarily know what's going on. Uh, only the elites know what's going on and they pass these things through symbolism and allegory. So um, it's, um, it, it's hidden. So with a lot of things, uh, first of all, powers don't have to be visible to be effective. Right. Um, the, the secret societies, they like to push forward a Christian, Freemasonry, likes to push forward a Christian view of themselves, um, but actually what they're talking about means something else entirely. For instance, the pillars of Jachin and Boaz uh, are two pillars in the Masonic second degree ceremony, and you can find images of the pillars of Jachin and Boaz. Uh, what were the pillars of Jachin and Boaz? Well, Solomon built his temple. And outside his temple, the scripture says he put the pillars of Jock and Boaz out there. So Freemasonry will say, well, this is a Christian symbol, a Christian ceremony. It represents Christ. But in fact, it means something else entirely. And we get into the Jewish mystical religion of Kabbalah, which comes from Romanticism. Um, the two pillars, one on top of one is a globe of the earth. And on top of the other is a globe of the celestial. Freemasonry has a secret. Rosicrucians share the secret. The secret uh, without going into all the details I talk about in the book, um, the pillar, the celestial globe of the earth and the celestial, uh, the celestial globe and the globe of the earth mixing is the mixing of the celestial with the mixing of the human. That is the secret of Freemasonry. Um, and when we talk about that, what is that? Well, the watchers are sending and sleeping with women, uh, the square and compass, the square on the Masonic symbol and the compass, the compass represents the heavenly masculine, the square represents the earthly feminine. Um, and so the secret is that the celestial will mix with the earthly. That could be angels coming back at the end days and sleeping with women and creating giant uh, offspring, the Nephilim again. It could mean demonic possession of the masses. It could mean um, the creation of chimeras, the mixing of the DNA with uh, alien abductions, alien abductions, uh, harvesting human sperm and eggs, um, which I believe aliens are demons. Uh, when we talk about these kind of aliens that we know they're greys, um, it could mean. So let's get into a, a point, a fascinating point. The mixing of the earthly and the celestial could also be the resurrection of Nimrod. So the image of the beast in Revelation, there's three beasts, in my opinion, three beasts in Revelation. There's the beast, uh, which is the Antichrist, possessed by Satan, comes out of the water. There is the beast of the earth, um, which is the false prophet. And then there's the image of the beast. So it's a little confusing and don't get confused by that. But the image of the beast, the false prophet, miraculously gives life to the image of the beast. It says, and that's a, that's a, what, another profound verse in scripture. I talked about God repenting that he made the earth. Another profound verse of scripture is Revelation 13, uh, 14, maybe. Um, in fact, the the uh, false prophet had power to give life to the image of the beast. God's the only one that's had power to give life throughout all of history and all of scripture until this point. It's like, what's going on here? Oh, um, so, yeah. so is it AI? Uh, we can give life to AI. I guess that's a technical uh, way to say it. But Revelation 13 says it'll be miraculous. It will astonish many. So I don't think it's AI. Um, a lot of folks will say that the image of the beast that stands in the temple and has knowledge because he knows if you're worshiping or not. A lot of folks in, in history have said it's a statue. Um, a lot of folks will say it's a clone, a soulless clone, AI, transhuman AI. Um, I theorize in the book that it is actually the resurrected mummy of Osiris, which is Nimrod. Um, the Freemasons talk about Osiris rising again. The Freemasons in many of their works say that Osiris will come back. He will be born a second time. Well, the ancient Egyptian coffin texts say 
that Osiris's body, he was the first mummy in Egyptian mythology, his body and his soul would be in the abyss right now, which is Nimrod. His body is protected by a supernatural fire. And in Revelation 13, just before the false prophet brings the uh, image of the beast to life, he calls down fire from heaven. Uh, so there are some links in the ancient Egyptian coffin texts. Um, in fact, Second uh, Thessalonians, Paul, I think it's Second Thessalonians, Paul talks about a restraining power, a power that restrains the beast uh, at a time. The beast has been, the beast will be, and the beast will be again. That's what he says. And so I theorize that it's um, the resurrection of Nimrod uh, in the image of the beast. It's, uh, it's a fascinating study. I love it. In Acts 5, we see that when Peter and the other disciples were ordered to stop talking about Jesus, they responded, we obey God and not man. In 2020, we saw something we never thought we could see in this country. They shut down our churches. After decades of removing God from schools and public institutions, they went straight at our community. Unfortunately, we as Christians did not know what to do. And even worse, we chose to listen to false prophets masquerading as Christians on how to respond. I recognize this is the only beginning, and we need to know how to respond. We have a duty to say no to unjust laws, but as Christians, we have a greater duty to God. In my book, On the Duty of Christian Civil Disobedience, I use biblical teachings to help believers know when and how to stand up to those in charge when they ask us to commit evil. You can go to peterdemas.org to find out about our duty to say no. And when you type in the code UNCOMMON, you can get 10% off your order. That's UNCOMMON at peterdemas.org. Remember, we are to obey God and not man. You know, I've heard uh, a, a pastor theorize that 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 the the has been you know and and will come again uh, is is Hitler, and, and because they said you know that that he is the he's the image that everybody recognizes, you know that that nobody would know what Nebuchadnezzar looked like, you know, of this day and age, no one would know who. Um, who, who any of these would look like, uh, Nimrod, I, I wouldn't know, you know, if you drew me a picture of Nimrod, I couldn't tell you who that was, but, but mm -hmm. where, where Hitler would be, but what you're saying too, is, is it, is it possible that Nimrod has made these appearances throughout? Mm -hmm. Um, is that possible or how does that, how does that work with the theory? That you're there? So there is a theory and it wouldn't be the, the person himself. Nimrod, it would be Satan or a, a evil spirit influencing or possessing this person. And again, possessing throughout history. One of the things we talk about in the bloodlines chapter, where we talk about the important families throughout the world behind the secret societies, is we talk about the ascended masters uh, as part of the mystical uh, Kabbalah. Uh, the ascended masters are people who have reached godhood already, and they have existed throughout history, immortal people who never die. Um, they're called the ascended masters. And... Uh, we talk about that in the book, um, see, Sir Fran not Sir Francis Bacon. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, Jesus was said to be one of them. Buddha was said to be one of them by the people who don't believe in Christianity. Um, so the idea that throughout the ages we've had an evil spirit or a person who's more, I think it's more of an evil spirit, keep on possessing the same people. But the seven-headed beast that comes out as the Antichrist in Revelation, there's a theory that those seven heads represent seven rulers where the Antichrist has tried before to usher in the final battle with the creator. We're talking about Hitler. We're talking about Napoleon. We're talking about, I think, Augustus is his name. Um, we're talking about seven figures throughout history uh, that have tried. The Antichrist has tried through them to do this. Um, the son of perdition um, and the Antichrist in the end times will be how he gets it done, the seventh. Um, so there is some uh, uh, credence to that theory. Um, you know, I, it's hard to know for sure, though. Right. So it's uh, All right, mysterious. So so I gotta I, I gotta ask this question and again. This is this is the you're talking about these secret societies and mm -hmm. but but how secret are they if you could find all this information about it? It doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be that secret, or is the secret more um because the, the general populace are blinded by it? Like how how is this how is this kind of a secret? Well, the um the the Bible says there will be a great deception uh, in the end times will deceive many. And of course, if anybody comes out with a conspiracy theory, um, the media immediately uh, shuns them, puts them in a box and says, you know, nobody listens to them. For instance, uh, Kathy Gibson, uh, no, no, Kathy O'Brien. Um, she uh, was a was sex trafficked um, by the United States senator. He's dead now. I hate to say his name. Um, anyway, she was sex trafficked for a long time. Uh, visited the Bohemian Grove many times where U.S. presidents go to do weird things. Um, we talk about that in the book. Um, and she says that 
uh, when she turned 30 years old, they told her that her body was no longer sexually useful. So they were going to sacrifice her in the fire to Moloch. Um, so, you know, those are weird claims. You know, how do you know uh, what they're telling is true? So it's not so much a gotcha moment. It's the same with uh, faith uh, in Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as your personal savior, God wants us to have faith. Right. Um, I don't know that he necessarily wants there to be physical proof of it for someone who thinks they're too smart. Um, I think creation is a testament. Uh, God says that creation is a testament. When any person with a rational thought that does not adhere to the religion of evolution, when they look at the world, they're like, wow, uh, God created a beautiful world. Um, evolution is a religion because it takes faith to believe in it. No one has ever seen Darwinian evolution in action, which is the changing of one kind to another. No one's ever seen that in action, and science has never reproduced that in a laboratory. So it takes faith to believe in evolution. Therefore, it's a religion. Um, that's one of my points. But um, so, yeah, they, they pass these secrets through symbolism and allegory. So my uh, book, of, of course, is there's some things I believe are fact, backed up in the Bible, backed up in what we see. But most of it is speculation. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say that we know for sure. But I think all these puzzle pieces fit together. When you look at an individual puzzle piece, it's like, well, what's going on here? But when you start to put them together, it starts to form a picture. So to answer your question, um, it's a lot of puzzle pieces uh, that form a picture. And, you know, when you study, things aren't a mystery if you know the answer. Right. So, the, so in studying the mysteries, this is what you got to do. Uh, for instance, uh, like we talked about the Book of Enoch, I don't take the Book of Enoch as inspired. But when you get all the puzzle pieces from the Bible and there's maybe a piece missing here and a piece missing there, the Book of Enoch fills those pieces in almost perfectly. So you can speculate that it's probably right about what it's talking about. So hmm. that would be kind of the answer. All right. And then and we're getting kind of toward the end. So so I guess it, it, it's just kind of almost sound like a flippant question and it's not intended to. Mm. But but yes, sir. so what? I mean, like, OK, they have these secret societies. How does this impact, you know, the 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 guy that that's that's waiting tables down the street or the construction mm -hmm. workers doing that type of stuff? Like what what can we do with this information? Like, how does this impact us in our day-to-day -day lives? Or what can we do to help become ambassadors of Christ knowing we have this information? Is is there is there a value to, to knowing this information? Or is it just kind of cool to have the information? Like, it's kind of cool to mm -hmm. study the Kennedy assassination or something like that. It's definitely very cool. Uh, there's other answers. But, uh, <laughs> it's definitely very cool for me. And there's a lot of people uh, who think it's cool. There's people who don't, and that's fine. Um, but again, I'll, I'll revert back to what Jesus said. Uh, Jesus says to be ready for his return as a good servant watches for the master's return and doesn't ignore it. Um, Jesus says to be ready for his return. And he gives us uh, talks about revelation. I would say he gives us clues. Revelation is not super clear on some things, but he gives us clues as to what the world will be like. And so, uh, you know, throughout my books, all of my books, um, secret societies, throughout all my books, I try to point people to Christ. But again, we're talking about mysterious stuff. And um you know, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, and I think that the knowledge of the watchers and the things that are going on uh, help point to what it will be like um, towards the end, which is important for us that uh, are going to be raptured out. Uh, and then I also write two or three places in my book. If you're reading this book after the rapture, this is what you need to know. Uh, for instance, the most important thing someone needs to know if they are not Christian and they, they're left with the tribulation is there will come many false Christs, and Scripture says, how will you know false Christ from the real Christ? And Scripture says, the false Christ will not admit that Jesus is the Christ. Don't be deceived by the term Christ. The term Christ is a title, and plenty of people claim the title Christ, and de demons claim the title Christ. Only Jesus is the Christ, so um, we need to know this kind of stuff so that we can be ready for his return. Cool. That's a, that's a great answer. I love that answer. <laughs> So, so if people want to know more about it, they want to be able to buy your book, uh, our books, um, and and you have several in the queue. It, it appears as well. So they they want to know more about it. Where do they go? How do they find out about it? Um, where can we go from here? Because I I'll, I'll be on again when we first started. I was kind of like, oh, I wasn't quite sure. Uh, but I'm definitely going to be buying some of your books because because this it is fascinating. It is one of those things that it's like I. I want to know more about it because I because I am ill informed in it, mm -hmm. um, and and just kind of make that determination from it because I don't think mm -hmm. if we have the information, if we don't have the information, we can't make a decision. It's we have to have the yes, information sir. to determine from here. So how can people find out about this? Where can they find out more about you? The Book of Daniel says that knowledge will be increased towards the end. Uh, folks can go to marginalmysteries.com. 
Um, we do uh, YouTube videos. Uh, I think they're fascinating. A lot of folks say they're fascinating YouTube videos about these topics, about why giants uh, raise, or excuse me, why Native Americans show their hand as a greeting is to see if you have six fingers or not. We have all kinds of awesome videos on, on cool. the giants and mysterious stuff. Um, but these three books behind me, um, you'll find on marginalmysteries.com, t-shirts, um, cool things. So marginalmysteries.com, marginalmysteries.com. All right. Wonderful. Well, well, Mike, thank you so much. I do appreciate you having on this. This really was, this was fascinating <laughs> and I, and I can't wait to look more about it. Uh, you said the YouTube, the YouTube channel was marginal mysteries as well. Was that? Yeah. All, all the social media is marginal, mysteries, but you'll find the links on the website uh, to all of the social medias. And, um, but I, I appreciate your time and your restaurant is delicious. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate you again. Thanks again. Thank you, Peter. When we talk about things of the spiritual nature, we do know there's a spiritual world and a physical world. We know this by, I mean, the Bible tells us, and obviously whatever the Bible says is true, it's true. Understanding what is spiritual and what isn't when we're physical beings is a little bit more difficult. We don't always understand it. But we do know there is a world that goes beyond just our um, just our understanding of it. We know there is a spiritual component that can impact us. And just because we can't see it doesn't make it untrue. Um, and so one of the things that we try to do here in Uncommon Sense is we're trying to figure it out truth because we do know there's truth and we know there is only one truth and that truth is the Bible. But we also know that there are things that go beyond our understanding. And even when we read the Bible, we have to put things on what I call the I don't know shelf. As I read it, I'm like, I don't understand how this works, but it doesn't limit its ability from being true. I'm not 100% certain that everything Micah said was 100% true or not true. I don't know, but it is definitely worth us looking into it and finding out more about it because it is important that we understand the spiritual components of it. I think he said it amazingly well at the end. We have to be prepared. We had to be prepared for when Christ returns. And if gathering this information and making that this determination and the, the decision of whether something is true or not true helps us become more prepared, we need to be able to do so. So I think it is, I think it is extremely valuable for us as we continue on our journey of life and continue on our journey of, of, um, of becoming more and more um, and trying to transform more and more into Jesus, because we do know there are such things as miracles that are outside of the realm of ordinary. It wouldn't be a miracle if it was if it was within the ordinary. We know there are things even scientifically that we can't necessarily explain. We do know, for example, that we I've never seen a virus, but I do know I've been impacted by a virus. I've seen the impact of of, of spiritual things myself. I've seen, uh, I've seen healings myself. I've seen, seen, um, um, uh, I've seen demon possessed, um, uh, of possessions before. It's not something I see often. It's not something that, that, you know, that, that I consider myself an expert in, um, but I do know it's out there. And I think as we continue to explore and work through, you know, how we're supposed to be, um, and how we are to, to, handle this as Christians moving forward. Now, for those of you who aren't Christians, this can be a little kind of weird and scary. And, and even for some of us Christians, it's a little weird and scary. And I, and I said it throughout the, through, throughout the interview, you know, it, it, but, but, but just because we feel uncomfortable with something does not make it untrue. Just because we feel uncomfortable with it, we have, I think, a duty and an obligation to explore it. You know, the, the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. It gives us discernment to determine what's right and wrong. And we're able to make this determination from it. I think that that I, I would highly encourage you to explore more from um, uh, from, from, from Micah's uh, uh, studies and, and, and understand it and make this determination on your own. Because, again, we have to be able to help us determine truth and understand what's going on around us. As we share the gospel, we need to know the things that are out there that might be preventing somebody from, from receiving Christ. And again, part of our job is, is or our main job, is to share the gospel and make disciples. And I think having a greater understanding of things that are around us will help enable us to be able to do so in a much better way and a much better light to be able to do this. So again, I thank you very much for joining uh, this show and um, I look forward to seeing you again.